Andy of Two Field Expeditions. I'm here with Josh today and we're very excited that we're interviewing Elspeth Beard, the first British lady to motorcycle around the world solo. Hi Josh, are you with us? Yes, hi Wendy. Hi. Hi, hi, Josh. hi, hi Josh. Hi, sorry to, sorry to be the, what we call in Hindi, kebab mein haddi, uh, which means uh, the, the bone in the, in the kebab. You know, the guy who's not supposed to be there. Uh, but I, I just wanted to uh, listen in firsthand and not just in recording. So I begged to be here. So I don't, I don't want to be a hindrance, but uh, I just uh, admire your work. And I'm an artist myself. So for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see uh, an artist who's done what you've done. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank you for bearing with me. So what was it that did inspire you to go from just, you know, riding motorcycles to becoming an adventure motorcyclist? Well, the term adventure motorcyclist didn't actually exist uh, 40 years ago, to be honest. <laughs> I just started riding bikes when I was uh, 16. Um, I got my first bike when I was um, 17 it was just a small Yamaha which I just used to ride around London it was just cheap easy way to get around I never imagined that motorbikes would become such a you know an important part of my life at all it was just easy cheap uh, you know way, way to get around London um, and then I bought a slightly bigger bike and then in 1979 I bought my BMW 60 stroke 6 and it was probably that bike that I suddenly realised that you could you could seriously go places. Uh, yeah. First trip was um, around Scotland, which I did on my own. Then I went around Ireland with a with a friend of mine. Uh, then I went around Europe um, <laughs> a few uh, the following summer, I think. And then in 1981, I decided to fly out to uh, the west coast of America and I bought a, a, an old BMW 75 stroke five uh, mm -hmm. and I rode it across to the east coast. And it was kind of somewhere on that journey, I kind of got this slightly mad idea, wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually ride a motorbike around the world? But yeah. kind of in those days, you have to try and imagine you know, it, it was, uh, you know, the world seemed like a much bigger place, you know, there yeah. was no internet, phones, and I mean, none of that social media, none <laughs> of that existed. Um, and it was very hard to find out about anything. And, and I didn't even know whether it was possible to, to ride a motorbike around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's how, you know, it, it was just so different to the way it is now. So it's a really a kind of series of events that happened to me the following year where I was broken hearted, uh, feeling very lonely and depressed. And uh, I'd, uh, as a consequence of that, I ended up with a very lousy degree. I've been doing my first three years architecture and I just thought I need to escape. And so yeah. I just decided I got a job in a pub, saved two and a half thousand pounds, learned as much as I could about my bike, uh, packed it up, shipped it off to New York and off I went. And I really had no idea how far I'd get, how long I'd be away, where I, I just not a clue. I just, I just, I just left and I just did it. I, I, I found about things, you know, out about things like on the road, because that's the only way that you could do it. it my only limiting factor was, was my money. Yeah. Time wasn't an issue. I could spend 10 years doing it if I wanted. Um, yeah. I, and because my parents were, shall I say, not exactly encouraging, um, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was very determined that I wasn't gonna ask them for any money ever. <laughs> to get mm -hmm. me out of anything i was going to do that i was going to do the trip entirely on my own um so i was adamant i would not ask them for a penny yeah yeah i know i well when i when i was re reading uh, your book uh, i just uh, again it blew me away that you know you arrived in in in, in australia in sydney with like 50 dollars on you <laughs> i was just like wow <laughs> 
you know, I think people can do a lot more than they think they can and they mm -hmm. can cope with situations but because if you have to you do i mean obviously i i'm, I'm going to do a bit of a shameless plug for us on uh you know two-wheeled expeditions because obviously our uh, our, our company do the, the motorbike tours in india and nepal yeah. so w which we were really interested in, in that part of uh, your your uh, journey as well so i, I was just going to ask what was your most unexpected experience riding in india oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, India, India, I have to say, I did find quite, uh, quite exhausting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and I think it's changed a lot over the last mm -hmm. 40 years. But in the early 1980s, um, I think being, you know, and I was only 23 years old, I was very mm -hmm. young, and I was on this huge motorbike. Well, you know, I mean, most people in India had never even seen a, you know, a bike like mine at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of much bigger than any bike they'd ever seen. And then there was this woman riding it. And, and so I, I, I kind of attracted a huge amount of attention. Yeah, for um, sure. And I think I hadn't really expected just the, the, you know, the volume of people um, that would be crowding around me every time I stopped, um, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just relentless. And, and mm -hmm. I know it was, they were just interested and they were excited and, you know, but for me on the other side of it, being entirely, and I felt, and I was so alone, you know, I was entirely yeah. on my own and I was really very young. Yes. Um, and it was all quite daunting really. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that by the time I got to India, I'd already been uh, on the road for, for nearly, well, for a year and a half, you know, so I was tired. I'd, I'd had accidents, I'd, I'd, I'd worked in Australia, I'd, 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 you know, I'd, I, and my bike was, you know, was starting to tire and I was tiring. So, you know, sure. it was a, and with all of that, I did find it a challenging country to travel through. And and what about your when you when you rode through Nepal? What were your highlights from there? Uh, I love obviously, Nepal. Yeah, but yeah. obviously Nepal, there are far less roads in Nepal. So I mean, I I just almost rode up up, up to Kathmandu. Uh, I mean, I have actually been been back to Nepal. I rode because uh, I rode uh, back in, I think it was in the eighty uh, sorry ninety eight. Uh, I flew out to Kathmandu and I and I picked up a um, uh, a Royal Enfield and I rode it over the Himalayas into Tibet okay. um, and back and that was an amazing trip. So I've done um, and I think I rode to Pokhara and back, but there weren't a huge amount of roads. Uh, but I I did do lots of walking. I did a you know I did a three and a half week trek. It, in Nepal, which was just, I mean, I love the country. It's one of my favorite countries. Absolutely mm -hmm. love Nepal. I mean, yeah. I'm a mountain person. I, I, I like oh. being high up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And yeah. was, it, it was Nepal that you, was it Nepal that you found that you'd fallen in love with, with your, um, I, well, no, I didn't fall in love with Robert then. I met him. I met him. <laughs> yeah. in yeah, yeah, we did meet on the streets of Kathmandu. Yeah, so but romantic. That had a slight kind of fondness for, for me as well because of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was just it was just a lovely, lovely country. It's beautiful. And, and this is probably going to be a, a really difficult one because I would imagine you've got so many of them. But what is your favourite memory of your two-year ride, if there is, if it's possible to have one? Oh well, I don't think you can have one. Um, yeah. I think I think one of, I mean, one of the highlights of the trip was um, was my ride up through Leh and Ladakh um, in northern India. Um, I mean, that was absolutely stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved riding around Rajasthan as well. That was amazing. Um, I mean, it kind of helped that I f fell in love with Robert when we were up in Leng and <laughs> back. So that kind of added, added um, to the romance. Yeah. Added to the romance yeah. of the place. Um, I, I love New, uh, New Zealand. Um, 
I love parts of America. I like I like some aspects of Australia. I mean, you know, it, it's just so much of a. I mean, it's just so much happened. I, I can't <laughs> sort of say, but I would say the you know the highlight was probably falling in love with Robert up in Leigh in the day. And what was your your biggest challenge on your travels? I mean, and how did you over overcome come it? You know, being on your own with you know limited resources and things. Yeah, I mean, there were many. I think I think dealing with with with, with the loneliness was 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 challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, I think staying healthy. Mm -hmm. um i think um keeping my bike going uh keeping myself going yeah um and it was always a constant worry that i was going to run out of money and i wasn't going to be able to get mm -hmm. home and what would i do mm -hmm. you know because literally my money i just carried in a in a in a money belt st strapped around my, my waist i didn't have a you know credit card or anything if you have to deal with things then you deal with them yeah uh, and it just makes you stronger because you realize how much you can cope with and how much you can deal with which you mm. wouldn't imagine that you could but you can no it's, it's true I, I and you know just um thinking about you know one of the the chapters in your book um you know when you were in Singapore and you were with your you were traveling with your friend at that point mm -hmm. and you got your passports and your money stolen from the bag you know in that that food stall and it was just how you know you overcame all of that because you know back then like you say there was no no faxes and and, and, and no kind of uh, technology to, for the DVLA for your motorbike um you know, logbook and everything that you had to replace and passports, that must have been, you know, quite a challenge yeah, as well. Yeah, it, it was a nightmare. In fact, I think that was the only time I did actually ask my parents for help because I was trying to deal with the DVLA in Swansea from Singapore. And mm -hmm. of course, there's like a 10 hour time difference and, and it was just impossible. And so mm -hmm. I asked my dad to step in and, and try and sort out my, you know, replacement um, documents, documents for my bike, yeah. which yeah. he did. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was different. But it, I think I was stuck in Singapore for eight weeks. And, and you know, what, what would have been the, the biggest life lesson you think you learned over the course of the, the two years? Uh, you know, you were out there solo. I think I think I learned I could do anything actually, and I think that yeah. is a, that is a, and that stood me stood with me for life. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there is nothing I don't feel I can take on. There's no challenge yeah. I, I, that, that that I don't think I can do. You you certainly have proved that as well with everything that <laughs> you you've made you made what you know in your your life. You've just like changed the the whole course of kind of like motorcycle riding for women as well. Really, you know with this well, first solo still, British woman. I still find that I still find that very hard to understand. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. it no, all it's... happened so quickly. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's really weird. If you'd written your book thirty years ago, do you think it would have your career would have taken a different path then? I don't know. I mean, I um, I mean, I'm not sure the world would have been ready for my books thirty years ago. To be honest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think the book, um, the book is much, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, because it's it had the passing of time and I can look back on things. And, mm -hmm. and I think writing it 35 years later actually makes it a better book. Um, yeah. Because when I got back from my trip, I didn't understand what my trip had given me. I didn't mm -hmm. understand all the the skills life skills that I've mm -hmm. learned uh, during my trip for many many years later and in fact it almost wasn't until I was actually writing my book that mm -hmm. I suddenly realized what my trip had given me and what mm -hmm. I'd learned and how it had kind of shaped shaped my life really mm -hmm. so yeah. I don't know and I I, I, I probably still would have carried on doing architecture. You personally, why do you think women um, account for like 50% of the population, but only 20% of motorcycle riders? Well, I think it's we've never been given much encouragement, should I say. I mean, when I started mm. riding 40 years ago, there were very, very few, few women riding 
you know, reasonable sized bikes. I mean, you saw women on scooters in London and stuff, but riding, you know, big serious bikes, you just didn't see them. And it was very, um, you know, it was not very encouraging when I used to go to into bike shops, you, you know, you felt as if you were laughed at, they would, they would just treat you as if you were, you know, like, what are you doing riding a bike? And it was all that male macho stuff that you have yeah. to put up with. Um, I mean, I think there's still a, still a, you know, a bit of it now, but it is better. It is a lot better. Mm -hmm. and I think the other thing is that you have to remember then that all that all the clothing you bought it was all for men. They didn't make yeah. it for women. So it was almost yeah. as if this is a only a man only world. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't mm -hmm. a world the women are even supposed to venture into. Yeah. So that was very much the feeling that you got. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt as if I was a bit of an oddity actually wanting to ride a motorbike because yeah. women didn't ride motorbikes. And so I think that's all changed. Um, and I think, you know, you see a lot more women now. And I'm sure, you know, it's gone up to 20%, but I'm sure most of that has probably happened in the last five to 10 years. You know, before that, it was probably a much, much smaller number. And so it hopefully it'll be exponential and, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and we'll get there, which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, when I did my round the world trip, the only bike boots I could buy were like a size and a bit too, too big for me because they were the smallest ones I could get. And I, and I rode around the world with newspapers stuffed in the, in the front of my boot because they were just too big for me. But it, was, it was that or, or nothing. Or, or, or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or your shoes or whatever. You know, yeah, that was, yeah. there was no choice. My leather jacket was ill-fitting. My trousers were, had all baggy bits in the wrong place. You know, it was just, it was just not made for women. We weren't supposed mm. to be riding bikes. That was the feeling that you were given. <laughs> what, what would be your next adventure at motorcycling destination? Well, I, I was actually, I was actually supposed to be doing a trip uh, in a uh, Tajikistan uh, oh, wow. in, okay. uh, last month but of course with everything going on uh, it was all cancelled. I'm going there next um, I'm going there next June uh, so that's my next big adventure. So that's oh good. that's fantastic yeah. it was fantastic yeah. well I wish you well for, for that adventure as well. Mm -hmm. If you could um, give you know one piece of advice to, to a woman you know considering a, a, a big sort of motorbike adventure uh, like you, you, you did, um, what would it be? Um, I think I'd say, uh, you know, work up to it. Don't just buy a bike, obviously, and, and, and venture off. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, do a small trip, then a slightly bigger trip. Then a, so, so you build your, you know, your confidence. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you learn about yourself, how you travel, and whether you actually enjoy it or not, you might actually mm -hmm. not enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. So, and believe in yourself, you know, mm -hmm. that you can do, you can do a lot more than you think you can, and you will be able to deal and cope with whatever, you know, gets thrown at, at you. You just have to go and do it. The other piece of advice is I'd say, is don't spend too much time social media and blogging you know, emailing, mobile phoning, you know, just enjoy where you are, experience yeah. the country, experience the people and mm -hmm. have an adventure, have fun. And also I'd say, don't over plan it. You know, mm -hmm. let, let yourself get lost. For me, I found it, you know, really interesting that, you know, obviously you've got all those memories of all those letters, people, you know, friends and family wrote to you. Yeah. And it was only every few months you like ducked into a post office somewhere and got them. So different, you know, from, from, from you know, today where you can like, instantly just like, you know, chat to somebody on your phone and things. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing it, is now, now you are never out of contact. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I was traveling, I was, um, I mean, for the periods of, you know, I used to phone home, I used to try and phone home once a month, um, certainly from America and Australia. 
after I got to the Far East, it got a bit sketchy because it was quite hard to find places because you because you had to find a sort of big international phone exchange. Mm -hmm. and then you had to book your call like a day beforehand and then you had to turn up and then and you had this kind of glass booth and they would put you through. So yeah, it was yeah. all a bit of a pain. I mean, it took like, you know, like two days of your time just to organise this phone call home. And then often you'd phone and then the parent, you know, you, my mum and dad wouldn't be at home. Or, oh, yeah. or like, oh, no. So, what are they um, and then once I got to India back, I don't think I phoned at all, actually. I just used to do letters. I used to try and write, write, but I... I mean, once I was on the home run, I, I kind of didn't write that much. Uh, it must have been nice, um, you know, while you're talking about phoning home, you know, and speaking to your parents, but it must have been nice when they came out to, to meet you in Nepal. Yeah, that was lovely. It was so, I mean, I hadn't seen them for a year and a half and they flew out. I mean, they did a kind of tour of India and then they came up to Kathmandu and they met me in Kathmandu. I mean, it was a bit weird, I, I have to say. The whole experience <laughs> was a bit strange. I think it was strange for them as well um but yeah it was lovely to see them it was good and it was nice for me because i got to stay in a five-star hotel in, in yeah in, yeah in I, I read that in your book. Which yeah. Is luxury luxury <laughs> after my tent and wherever yeah. hostels and tents so it's great <laughs> you know, I, I read that bit in your book and it did make me chuckle because it was like you no know, it's, it's, it's so, so different wasn't it and you're like wow it's so luxurious <laughs> i know it's, it was brilliant i always remember that yeah that's great well um, that's kind of my uh, my questions for you i mean i know i could probably like speak to you for hours and have 100 more questions personally but i just thought um uh, if you don't mind if josh had uh, a few questions for you from yeah. one artist to another because i know he's really okay. interested in your architecture work as well so josh would you like to to ask elspeth anything um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still reeling from uh, all the answers and uh, just, I just kind of got transported back to uh, your trip and uh, I, I think not much has changed if you arrived in India even now uh, with a big bike, uh, you would get a huge crowd uh, because it's still a quite, quite a bit of novelty. Um, I, I, my, my, my question is, is um, is there something that you uh, adopted from or adapted into your architect profession uh, while because of your exposure uh, to globe traveling or did that kind of influence you uh, because you must have seen a lot of great architectural sites and uh, uh, yeah. did that have any yeah i think i think it did actually but it in a in a strange way i wasn't sort of conscious of it when it was happening to me but when i was traveling uh around and just seeing all the different houses you know all the different cultures and the houses and the I, when i when i left on my trip i know this might, might sound a little bit dark but when i left on my trip I didn't really understand what, what architecture was all about. I mean, I'd, I'd done my first three, I mean, I went to art college and then I was good at sculpture. So they said, why don't you go and do architecture? So I thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So I just ended up doing architecture in a kind of fairly unplanned way. Um, and for the first three, three years, I honestly didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, I, I, I knew it was, a, and it was really on my trip uh, because I, I worked for uh, some architects when I was in Sydney because I was completely broke and so I had to earn some more money. So I worked for, for these architects in Sydney for seven months and that's probably the time it all kind of clicked. I, I remember going to my first building site and I'd been working on all these plans and all these drawings. And I went to this building site and I saw all these, these, these plans coming out of the ground. And I suddenly thought, that's what it's all about. <laughs> and I know yeah. it sounds completely, but it was suddenly seeing all my drawings become three dimensions. And it was the most extraordinary kind of light bulb moment, you know, in, in, in my brain, it was brilliant. And then, and then after that, I suppose I traveled all, all through Southeast Asia and India and Nepal and saw all the amazing buildings and the forts and the temples and yeah all this kind of stuff so it all kind of went in I, I you know I, I was kind of absorbing it all without really and I think in my work now I never 
I mean, I've done hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of projects, but I don't really have a style. I don't think I, I t all my projects are very different. Um, mm -hmm. And because I do the project that's, that obviously is, is suitable for the site or the building or where it is, it's not, you know, I don't stamp my style or not my style really my my you know i don't Signature. have a set way oh. of, of, of of approaching um pr projects every project i kind of approach in a slightly different way uh, i treat it as very much as an individual separate project from all, everything else i've done um and that and if you look at my my portfolio of all my projects they're all very very different and you wouldn't sometimes you may not think the same architect had designed all of the you know all these completely different kind of houses you know stone from render to brick to timber frame to you know it's just all styles and I just and that I think I got from the you know I learned as I was traveling I I will only take projects on that are a real challenge i mean you know we have a joke in my office that we always get the projects that no other architect wants because they don't know how to do them and so we get all these really difficult projects nightmare projects that no other or we get projects that other architects have tried to solve the problem and failed and then they end up on my desk and then and then we solve them wow and and i i wanted to know in your profession does your reputation as a, as a motorcyclist uh, get mentioned or do people typecast you as this, this lady who went on a, on a solo adventure? Is, is that, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, like it, the label? Uh, I don't know, because I, I think people now, they kind of Google me if they, to get my details. And so all my motorcycling stuff come, comes up the same as all my architecture stuff. And so if I have a client who, 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 who wants me to do a project for them, uh, you know, they'll phone up and we'll talk about the project and then we'll arrange to meet. And then right at the end, they'll say, so will you be coming on your, on your motorbike? <laughs> and I go, well, I might be if it's not raining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they obviously know, but they don't, yeah. you know, so they, and I think, I think most of them quite like the fact that um, they think I'm going to be a slightly, uh, you know, not your average architect. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of clients I attract and that's the kind of work I attract. And uh, I'm excited because I'm part of the, the Indian motorcycle community and, uh, you know, I'll be able to, to share a little bit because I think you, you, people in India don't really know uh, as much uh, as let's say in Europe and in America yeah. and uh, I think you might start to hear a little bit more from this side of the world as well. I know. That would be amazing I mean if my if my um, if my uh, story became known in India I'd find that very <laughs> really well, extraordinary but that's brilliant I mean it'd be amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, and and, and uh, thank you. I mean, I, I and I know Josh probably is the same. We'd have hundreds of questions for you, but I just think you're just so fascinating and so inspiring, um, and, and you've got such an adventurous spirit about you. I love the fact that after all your adventure for um, motorcycling around the world, that you then went and got your private pilot's license, um, <laughs> and you took a plane around Australia. I just think you know oh. there is no limits to you, is there, Elspeth? <laughs> I like to keep moving, you know, I like to keep challenging myself, but it's important to push yourself. You have to it is. What, what, what's your next big challenge you're going to challenge yourself with? Well, I'm, I'm, I recently, um, well, I'm learning to fly, to fly a, uh, a helicopter at the moment wow. because I'm not very good. I'm not very good at having my hands and my feet doing two different things. I'm not very, so... So that to me is a real challenge to try and learn how to, to train my body to do, you know, feet doing one thing, hands doing the other. Yeah. Really complicated. Um, so I'm learning to do that at the moment. Um, wow. And then I've just got lots of, you know, I've got all my, my, my work. I've got uh, loads of bike events I do. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've got, I've got plenty to do. Plenty. Well,
I just wanted to say, you know, uh, it's been an honour to, to interview you. Um, I've been absolutely delighted. Um, I was very nervous and <laughs> very excited because when you agreed to the interview, I actually had to peel myself off the ceiling because you'd said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you and I, I just want to say on behalf of Josh, Rob and myself at Two Field Expeditions thank you so much for taking the time out to to come and speak with us as well. Oh no it's, it's been great thank you very much.